All right, everyone, welcome to the X Umbras podcast. That's Clark McClarney, and with me is Schoolman Fawcett, and we are teachers at uh, the Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore Learning Center, the world's only online Chesterton Academy. Uh, so, this is a classical Catholic education in podcast form. Uh, we are capturing in this podcast what it's like a little bit to be in one of our online meets at this online Chesterton Academy. This is yeah. get to sit in on the equivalent of a classroom. That's right. Uh, now, one of the great things about being an online school is we have students from all over the world, or right. at least all over the continent. You're um, all, yeah, okay, more than one, two continents. Yeah, there's a couple. Oh, well, yeah. okay. Two. There's some in Europe. Fair enough, touche. Yeah. All right, so there is... Yeah, that's right. Oh, good point, actually. So, okay. Actually, yes, that's true. We have, we have pretty far-flung uh, students. So we have a student... Uh, we're based in Canada. Yep. Uh, we have a student from outside of Canada, from the United States, yep. who uh, is a member of my English uh, 11 class, grade mm-hmm. 11 class, yeah. And in English 11 for Chesterton Academy, we study the Divine Comedy of ah, Dante. Okay. And uh, this student, this is one of the things that's so enriching about being a, a teacher at Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore Learning Center is yeah. like, the quality of feedback you get from students and the connections that they can make. Okay. Uh, as we concluded the Divine Comedy, I yeah. asked if anyone had any reflections. And the student, uh, whose name I won't mention, but I will say she's female because that's important, she yeah. said that uh, it reminded her, she, she realized that this recent album by Hosier, made references to the Divine Comedy, okay. to the Inferno. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's really neat. First of all, good for you for noticing that. Right. Um, yeah. But I asked her a little bit about uh, this, and we had a bit of a discussion. Okay. And eventually I realized that uh, there is content here for us to talk about uh, on a podcast. This is a good uh, example, actually, okay. I think, of classical education. Because right. we, we've discussed before uh, listening to modern pop music sure. or watching yeah. movies through the lens of classical education. Yeah. And, the, and in one sense, people think classical education. It means you read the classics. And that is true. Yeah. That, that shapes the way you think. And Dante is an important writer for this. His, his letter to Cangard, where he kind of explains, you need to read the Divine Comedy the same way you'd read the Bible. It's very important text for how to interpret classics. But it's also about, it, it's a way of reading any text, or watching any uh, film, or listening okay. to any piece of music. Yeah. You can do it in a classical way. Sure. Uh, by applying some of the interpretive lenses we've talked about, that originally are developed to interpret yeah. scripture, right? The four yeah. senses. And uh, this is a good example of that. So uh, we've, uh, I, I asked the student well, here, here's, to, here's another to some songs for us yeah. to look at. You know. Here's another idea, though, as a fruit of classical education, Ooh. is that you, uh, I don't know if this is the, the best metaphor or not, but it's almost like Israel in exile. Mm. And by what I mean is um, we're, we find ourselves in a world which is continually moving. So the ground beneath our feet is shifting. And that causes, this tumult causes all sorts of confusion, consternation, mm. and anxiety uh, amongst uh, individuals. And so a rooting in the classics provides us with an anchor of sorts. Mm. It provides us with a grounding in which we can understand where uh, Western culture has come from. Mm. Uh, it, it also in which uh, much of our faith has been articulated. Mm. And that allows us then to see where we are now. Sure. And uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, it depends on how you, how you if you're a pessimist or optimist, but uh, mm-hmm. wherever things end up going, mm-hmm. um, we have a light, a beacon, a ground for understanding where we are, where we're going for, uh, where we're going to, and by extension, Babylon, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we, have, we have an ability now to understand <clears throat> what it's what others are saying, articulating, who... who um, mm-hmm might be going somewhere else in, in, in their trajectory or have a different vision of where things should be headed. Hmm. That's, a, that's a very astute way of putting that. Because my first, so I had only ever uh, heard one Hosier song. Hosier, okay. It's apparently Hosier. I looked up interviews of him. But it's like yeah. three syllables. So it's, I'll, I'll try to say it. Hosier. Yeah, right. uh, he's from yeah. Ireland. You know, yeah. Maybe it's, it's the accent or something. Okay. But uh, I, like most of the world, back in 2014, I heard Take Me to Church, which was right. his song that got really popular. And that was a song that used religion as a metaphor for an intense romantic relationship. Yeah. And it was, of course, controversial because it was yeah. seen, you know, rightly as, like, sacrilegious or blasphemous. Yeah. Now, I, it, it was also, I thought, not that great of a song. I thought it was sort of dreary and not that well written. Uh, that same motif has done... Uh, our own Canadian poet Leonard Cohen did that a lot. Right. right? Hallelujah is a very sure. famous example. Yeah. Uh, Madonna did this as well right, right in the 80s. So yeah. I, I didn't think it was, I mean, it, you know, it's offensive, but it's not, it's, it was not that interesting to me. So I asked the student, you know, what, did she, what does she respond to about Hosier? Why does she like listening to him? And so I'll, 
I'll, I'll, I'll quote from her email. First of all, okay. she said, the vibes are top tier. Uh, now, right. full, full disclosure, I think we agree. Because we, we started listening to this uh, most recent album of his, Unreal Unearth, for research purposes. And I yes. think we've both become a little addicted to it, y- yeah. um, which we'll get into. Yeah, but I we've think, been listening yeah. to it on loop a little bit. So yeah. fair enough. We agree yeah. with you. The, the vibes are immaculate. Um, and then she talks about how she appreciates the way he knits together mythology, politics, and religious imagery in a three-minute pop song about being in love. Now, fair enough. Now, I mean, I, we're going to critique some of his use of classical literature right. and mythology, but it's, it's um, commendable that he's doing it. You know, it's impressive that he's able to kind of uh, work in that world, let's say, right. I think. Yeah. Uh, now, this is the interesting thing, because as I was doing research on Hosier, I, I saw one video called, uh, Why Do My Teenage Daughter's Friends All Love Hosier? Oh, so I'm going to wow. guess that there's, our, our student is not the only um, young lady who, who likes this stuff. Okay. So her comment was, um, it's nearly impossible to find a male artist who writes about women in a way I find remarkably similar to the female gaze. Uh, of course, you know, it's a concept from sociology, right? There's the male gaze, so the way that men view each other and women. Oh, the yeah. female gaze is kind of the inversion w- of that. What's, what's the difference? <laughs> well, that's a whole sociology. Oh, okay. Well, you know, like, well... The way that okay, like think of an action movie from the eighties. Okay, how about that as an emblematic of how are the men portrayed, how are the women portrayed? That okay. would be a, that. Some might say that's an example of the male gaze, right? Oh, okay. Um, and it's you know, and I, feminists and sociologists might say that's the default setting for society because it's male dominated or it's patriarchal. Okay, that's, I mean that's a that's a, an interesting topic in its own right. But uh, the female gaze would be kind of uh, a womanly perspective on these things and she, and our our student says that Hosier is able to capture that. She oh, she says uh, okay. everybody loves women. Right? Everybody loves women she writes. But in music it's unusual to find adoration without a desire to possess. In his music, mm. love is close to worship, and the farthest thing from ownership. Now, this is—I mean, this is a bit like what you're saying about Babylon. If, if this, people yeah. are responding to this, I guess it needs to be explored. But what's your response to this? Well, just, just to revisit that for one second. So she's saying it's close. It's not possession, but it is adoration. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. I think so. So, so this is adoration, but not possession. And the other line there was. Uh, oh. Related to that. Well, he, he um, everybody loves women, but it's unusual to find adoration without a desire to possess. And this oh, might right, be part right. of the male yes. gaze, right? Okay. Is that maybe right. the male gaze is women are like uh, beautiful and they're like trophies. Right. You know, the, the more you accumulate, maybe the more impressive you are, yeah, or you yeah. conquer them, right? Sure. You know, it's a sign yeah. of your masculinity. Okay. So this could be even a Baconian uh, type of vision of reality where we manipulate objects and so forth, and people are just other objects, including women. So that's why we want to possess yeah, or them. Like, or like, like, Good old Machiavelli saying, "Fortune is a woman, and you need oh, to right. conquer and tame her." If you're right, right. And, and young men are better at this, and you know this kind of deal. Or that would be yeah. the, maybe a male gaze perspective, yeah. as so. opposed to receptivity, perhaps, and and sure. just in, in, yeah. enjoying the presence of another for who they are. Possibly something yes. along those lines. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's there's wonderful avenues we could go down there about uh, Bernard of Clairvaux talking about the soul being kind of feminine towards God or something like that. Right. But, uh, but I think yeah. today, instead of that, we're in Machiavelli. We wanted to talk about another <laughs> Italian who also wrote about love, yeah. which is Dante, who right. uh, Hosier admits uh, he in- was in- inspired on right. Real on Earth. Now, this album came out a couple of months ago, I think. August or recently. Uh, 2023, I yeah. think the full thing was released. I, okay, that makes sense. So, um, he, uh, so Hosier talks about, uh, in interviews that I've seen, how he, he during lockdown, he had been reading uh, The Inferno by Dante. Yeah. All right. Who wouldn't? Who yeah. wouldn't? Of course. Yeah. Well, sure. Yes. Um, now it is. This is important. Dr. McClarney has a copy of the in- of the Inferno, which is not a book. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, and in some ways that inspired his reflections. So so the album in some ways is is riffing on that because in some sense we were all in hell and we were all going in circles, not getting anywhere. You know, during lockdown, he he, he describes. Yeah. Um, and, and the two two of the three songs that, that our student pointed to, he ex- uh, Hosier explicitly connects to circles in hell, which which uh, maybe this is worth taking a moment to say if you haven't read the Inferno is oh, Dante's yeah. poem about his descent into hell, or at least it's the beginning of a poem. Yeah, and it talks about his descent into hell, which is nine circles, each circle is dedicated to a sin, yeah. and as he travels, he sees the people there and how they're being punished and how they're suffering. Now. Yeah. No pun intended, but it's okay. infuriating to me uh, that people talk about Dante's Inferno. That is the first book of 
of a whole poem, a big epic poem called The Divine Comedy. Oh, which yeah. doesn't mean it's a wacky slapstick event where Dante's going to step on some rakes and hit himself in the face and make oh. jokes. It's comedy because it has a happy ending. Uh, uh, it's three s- books. There's the Inferno, there's the Purgatorio, and there's the Paradiso. It ends with him oh. ascending into heaven. So, okay, this is only part one. All right. This is only part one. This is say, talking about, I mean, it's like talking about the Fellowship of the Ring or something. I mean, sure, okay, in one sure. sense it's a book, but yeah. it's not like really the Lord of the Rings is one oh, novel, right? Yeah, right? You know? And if you just stop at Fellowship of the Ring, you haven't got the whole story. Okay. Now, the modern world, I think because it's sort of departed from God, yeah. has trouble understanding the Paradiso and the Purgatorio because yeah. they're about virtue. But they understand the Inferno yeah. because it's all about sin and vice. And uh, Hosier understands this. Hosier, uh, a little bit of background, he, his, fe- his parents were Irish Catholics, but they converted to Quakerism. Right. Yep. Now, the Society of Friends, which is a very, they have no real liturgy, the Quakers. They, right. their, their meetings are they sit in circles and they wait for someone to be led by the Holy Spirit sure. to speak. Yep. So it, it's not high liturgy, it's not high doctrine. It's more about personal encounter with God and political activism. You, know, you have a lot of Quakers right. who are yep. you know, anti-war protesters. Uh, and Hosier himself, uh, is now an agnostic, I would argue he's basically still a Quaker. Okay. Because, you know, he has a sort of personal relationship with... He says he, he still sees the divine in every person, which he says he learned from the Quakers. Right. right? There's a divine spark in everybody. So yeah. I, I would argue he's still a, he's still a Quaker. And, and, and what's interesting is his political activism... But, but does he uh, insist on that, on being agnostic? Like, well, I, I don't being, know. I think uh, insisting on being agnostic is a bit of a contradiction uh, in terms. Okay, sure. I think being emphatic that you don't aren't sure... <laughs> it's sort of psychologically difficult. Right, I know um, that I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a little paradoxical. So okay. I'm not sure if he's in, if he's insistent on that. Okay. Um, but I would say he, it's interesting because he is also a uh, Irish nationalist, right? He, comp- mm. he protests English colonialism of Ireland. Uh, there's a wonderful, sad song on this album called Un- "A Butchered Tongue" right. about that. Uh, which I think, if you really want to protest England's oppression of Ireland, you should become a Roman Catholic. Oh, <laughs> because I think no a bunch way. of English Protestants oppressing uh, okay. Irish Catholics. I mean, yeah. that's the ultimate act of counter-colonialism, <laughs> I would say, yeah. is, a, okay. is to become Catholic. Um, so anyways, that's a bit of context for, um, for Hosier. So I originally listened to the three songs that were recommended by the students, two of which are from this recent album, Unreal on Earth. Uh, those are Eat Your Young and Francesca. And there's another earlier song he did called From Eden. But to give myself some context, I listened to the whole album, and then I sent the whole album to you, and we've uh, we've yeah. really we've done it. We've listened to it a lot, so we have lots to say. And and of course, I've been revisiting Dante um, to sort of see how he compares to Hosier and how they have maybe different interpretations of the same theme. Which would go to what you're talking about. The classics give us a a rooting, mm-hmm. right, in a world that's always changing, and people mm-hmm. have different uh, directions they're going. The classics are about what's sort of eternal, that give us some uh, some something solid to stand on. You know, in the midst of the changeable, you know. Oh no, absolutely. So, uh, um, okay. Now, do we want to jump into Francesca or or Dante or how do how do you? Well, you want I to suppose we should uh, before we should talk about Francesca, we will have to talk a little bit oh, about how she appears okay. in Dante for so, the song to make any sense, right? Um, but you, you know, you've also taught Dante, so feel free to 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 take charge of this part of it. Um, you know, so Dante. Okay, so as we mentioned, the Divine Comedy is in the Inferno specifically. It's about Dante's descent into hell, yep. into the Inferno. Um, and it begins with him in great confusion and darkness, which so does Unreal on Earth. Yeah. And uh, then he's guided by Virgil into hell. And I, I, this is, okay, all right, this is worth talking about, all right? So the first circle of hell, and there's much we're skipping over because that's the nature of this text. Uh, he is the limbo of the unbaptized. So the great Asian pagans who never heard about Jesus but lived virtuous lives, yeah. they're there. It's a pretty cool place as far as hell goes. It's like a coffee shop or a university. Yeah. Um, but he meets the great poets of antiquity, and right. they sort of embrace Dante as one of their own. And I have seen so many people say that this is Dante just patting himself on the back and yeah. complimenting himself, and this is just kind of an act of pride and hubris on Dante's part. Yeah. And I mean, he does this a few times in the in the infer, in the Divine Comedy, right. where he'll sort of take something from Homer or Virgil and kind of improve on it, sure. <laughs> you know, and show yeah. off how he's doing it better. But I don't think that's exactly what's going on here. I don't think he's saying, I'm a great poet. I, I think he's saying, I'm a great poet, which means I'm a great sinner. Because mm-hmm. this leads into the second circle of hell, which is okay. the circle of the lustful. Right. The lustful are being blown around endlessly. Yep. Right. Uh, because lust means you're not in control of yourself anymore. Right. Uh, Dante is very Augustinian, uh, and as far as it goes, he's very Thomist. 
right? right. Thomism is very Thomas Aquinas is very new at this time, but I'm sure all these Italians knew each other. Yeah. But it's very Augustinian, right? It's yeah. reason has and, you know, and by extension Neoplatonic, right? Reason has to rule our actions. Um, reason has to work in accordance with will, yep. but if you let lust and desire and passion rule you, you're not in control of yourself. You're being right. blown about endlessly. Yes. And uh, in this circle, he meets Francesca and uh, Paolo. Right. Uh, this is the, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the only time a woman speaks in the Inferno. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, off yeah. the top of my head, I think it is. Okay. And, and she's the one who speaks. Paolo doesn't. Right. Uh, even though they were lovers. Yeah. And the gist is that she was married. Uh, Paolo was her husband's brother, a much younger brother. The two of them were reading the story of Lancelot. Oh, interesting. And Guinevere. Yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, Guinevere is married to Arthur, but she shares a kiss with Lancelot. And she's so moved. They're both so impressed by this uh, portrayal of illicit but passionate love that they choose it. They know it. They know it's wrong. Mm-hmm. But, they, but when you're in love, you can't control what you're doing. You're out of control yes. of yourself. And they share a kiss... And her husband is so enraged, he kills them both. And that's why they're here. Right. And um, this is, even before Hosier, a lot of people have commented, commented on um, how almost sympathetic Dante seems to them. You know, she gives oh, this very absolutely. powerful speech in, oh. about how great love is, you know, yeah. and how love just carried her away and she just couldn't control herself anymore. And that's a yeah. theme that we get in a lot of pop music, even. Yes. <laughs> this yes. Day, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we've had this discussion before, but mm-hmm. I'm I'm not as sympathetic uh, to Dante to uh, the, the last full uh, the adulteress. Uh, I don't, I don't think it should actually just be the first uh, strata. Really, when you really get into hell itself, right beyond its waiting room, uh, <laughs> sure. uh, because uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but but uh, mm-hmm. for. For one, uh, it's it's breaking a solemn vow before God. Sure, uh, yeah. So it's not just simply indulging in um, an appetite or a passion, mm-hmm. which is natural and good to us. Uh, it's actually uh, breaking the fissures mm-hmm. of this solemn uh, union, which mm-hmm. is a sacramental union, which is ordained by God and something which we live out mm-hmm. in his light. Uh, and so mm-hmm. being the marriage, being the image then of the church, uh, the, uh, Christ's union uh, with us, it's not something that is, uh, I, I think, can just be mm, on the surface of things or, or on this, this mm-hmm. upper level. I think it's actually one of the most, I would put it more closer to uh, 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 Judas uh, and uh, Brutus and so on, sure. uh, where it's it's the most profound uh, uh, offense mm-hmm. that that one can actually commit because yes, mm-hmm. it's impassionate, uh, right, or right. it's inflamed by the passions, but this is betrayal par excellence because you are now not only defiling the the marriage bed. But also the um, the bounds of one's own family, which mm-hmm. which are the fruits of 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 marriage, mm-hmm. and, and so it's contaminating with this trickle down effect on um, yeah, all sorts of facets of life. I mean, not to go down all the, the fruits of the sexual revolution and so on, but if you look at say like abortion, divorce, um, oh, we'll get to uh, that. We're yeah, getting we're getting all, there. All, all sure. of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll are uh, precipitate from from that. Mm-hmm. D- watering down of those those bonds. So I, I definitely d- disagree with Dante. Now Dante, of course, being a great poet of love, uh, pr- mm-hmm. pr- prior to writing the Divine Comedy and so on, I mean, perhaps he has uh, um, some sympathy uh, mm-hmm. and, and so on for this, and maybe he doesn't see it. I mean, I don't know if it is... Well, I, no, I, 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 I see where he's coming from. I won't argue with you, but I think, but I, I see where he's coming from in that, as you alluded to, because, because at the beginning, okay, so the deeper you get into hell, the worse the sins are. And, yeah. and again, this, but this is consistent. The worst thing has to do with the more rationality is involved. You know, the more you consciously oh, choose evil. Well, please. So, so like, okay, I'm embracing uh, my husband's brother. Like, this is not a, uh, there's going to be some rationality here. Like, oh, should I, uh, is this a red light? Does that mean go or does that mean stop? Right? Well, so, so, sure. I mean, but that's like, I mean, the gluttons are at the top. I and mean, the, the, near the top are those who are, who are the sins of passion. So there's, there's, they're guilty. They yeah. consciously chose evil, but there is a mitigation of their, um, of how severe it is relative to, and again, and, and sometimes, I mean, this is this is part of moral theology, right? It's not always yeah. just the object that makes an act evil. There's also the intention of the circumstances, right? Sure. So there might yeah. be something that that is um, of less severity than you know cheating on your husband. Uh, that's a very grave object, uh, but the intention and the circumstances 
are also at play. I mean, we should do an episode on this, on the three sources yeah. of the moral act. Yeah. Um, regardless, I mean, uh, Hozier takes a completely different line on this than you do, and he's not the first to do so. To, sort of, <laughs> to say Because w- one way of reading this is Francesca and Paolo, they chose love for each other over everything else. Like, they were willing to go to hell because they loved each other so much. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. And that's, uh, well, that's very compelling to some people. Well, you know, as, uh, absolutely. I mean, Romans chapter 9, Paul's willing to go to hell uh, for the love yes. of right, yeah, his yeah. flesh, right? right? Well, uh, 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 yeah, he'd rather he'd go to hell if it meant Israel could be saved. Yeah, his flesh. Which, yeah, yes. his flesh can be Mo- saved. Moses says nothing similar, yeah. right, to God. Yeah, so... so um, but this isn't for the sake of anyone's salvation. This is because <laughs> right. they love each other. Yes. All right. And it. so, um, do you have the lyrics there for? So, uh, so there's a song okay, called Fra- going, there's a song uh, called Francesca. Okay. Yeah. On Unreal on Earth, and Hozier talks about in interviews how um, he he found himself sympathetic to Francesca and to Paolo, who, yeah. like I said, doesn't speak. So this song is supposed to sort of be his words in some ways, maybe her words too. So uh, you have the lyrics there? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Sure, do you want to read those, those out loud? Or some, okay, some of those, well, at least, maybe the okay. first verse and chorus. Do you yeah. think I'd give up that this might have shook uh, the love from me? Or that I was on the brink? How could you think, darling, I'd scare so easily? Now that it's done, there's not one thing that I, should, I would change. My life was a storm since I was born. How could I fear any hurricane? If someone asked me at the end, I'll tell them. Put me back in it. Darling, I would do it again. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, if I could hold you for a minute, a uh, darling, I'd go through it again. Ah, uh, I would still be surprised if I could find you, darling, in any life. If I could hold you for a minute, darling, I would do it yes, again. Yes, just for one minute of holding Francesca, he would go to hell, you know. Uh, for uh, that, all that was said. Uh, or we'd end up at the end of it. When the heart would cease, ours never knew peace. What good would it be for the far side of things? It was too soon. When that part of you was ripped away, a grip taking hold like a cancer that grows, each piece of your body that it takes. Though I know my heart would break. I'd tell them, put me back in it, darling. I would do it again. Ah. Uh, if I could hold you for a minute, darling, I'd go through it again. Uh, I would be surprised if I could find you, darling, in any life. If I could hold you for a minute, darling, I would do it again. I would not change it uh, each time. I would not change it each time. Heaven is not fit to house a love. Heaven is not fit to house mm-hmm. a love. Like you and I, like you and I. I would not change it each time. I would not change it each time. Heaven is not fit to house a love. Heaven is not fit to house a love. Like you and I. Like you and I. I would not change it each time. I would not change it each time. And it repeats, heaven is not fit to house a love. Heaven is not fit to house a love. Like you and I. Like you and I. And I think that repetitive, well, we can come back to that too. Mm, okay. But okay. Uh, so those are the lyrics um, as I, I found them. So, Sure. Okay. So, um, Gosh, what can what can we say about that, right? Um, well, we'll say first of all that sentiment is pretty ancient, and uh, mm. you alluded to this, but Dante himself had yes. dabbled in this. So before he writes the Divine Comedy, yeah. he he's a, a he purveyor. Made a name for himself. He made a name for himself writing what's now called a courtly love poetry, right? A courtly love has uh, familiar tropes, um, and and part of the you know, I mean, it's still in some ways our modern idea of romance is mm-hmm. kind of invented That's right. by the courtly love poets. And there's this idea that, you know, you, you, there's this intense longing, almost yep. worshipful longing, yep. um, perhaps even inspired by religious poetry, I've heard mm-hmm. it suggested, mm-hmm. right? And that there's almost, there's almost of necessity an adulterous element in it. Uh, almost, well, well, almost. Yeah, yeah. so it yeah. can still, like, for the regular, like, chaste, uh, um, a reader, right? Right, uh, yes. can, can be enamored with this, this type of poetry. So it's not necessarily... Um, the intent to incite you to uh, elicit uh, relations or anything like that, but it's I, I think it uh, if you want to take a generous look of it, uh, it's to just incite within you that that passion for the beauty uh, of another that that grips us. Sure, right, right. Uh, that grabs us. Yeah. Now I suppose if you want to, the better the poem, I suppose, uh, <laughs> the greater desire it would evoke, or or the 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 within our minds. I mean, poetry is is metaphysical, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the the greater the reality of the poem, mm-hmm. uh, the more we find ourselves absorbed in it, and so on, which uh, can lead to the erasure of. Uh, yeah. of uh, well, balance. I mean, but it's a lot of times it is sort of like a knight yearning for a queen or something like that, like someone who, with whom he can't, by definition, have. 
or socially have, right? Right. And yeah. in spite of that fact that he can't have her, he still loves her. That but that's how great the love is, right? Yes. Even though it's yeah. forbidden, it's still present, right? And that is part of the appeal. Something right. about the fact that it's forbidden makes it so alluring, right? Uh, and self-sacrificial, yeah. almost, you know. But right, okay. yeah, yeah. I guess, and then it depends on the the bounds then that the, the knight will ultimately uh, uh, respect or not. Uh, sure. But, and, yeah. uh, and Dante himself had fallen in love with a girl named Beatrice, right. uh, who he never got that close to, and who died before he could, and he was married to somebody else. But he wrote uh, love poetry about and to her, and that will come up again in the Divine Comedy. But in one early uh, poem, he uh, it's in La Vida Nuova, right, the New Life. Uh, he has a line uh, in one of his poems that love and the gentle heart are one. Oh. And uh, what's very interesting is now he finds himself having written that line. Now yeah. he's in hell. And right. he's talking to Francesca, who's talked about how what she has read mm-hmm. has inspired her to commit this sin that has damned her. Yeah. And she talks about Lancelot, although yes. she didn't read to the end of the story. Okay, that's a very important detail. Which I don't, you, you yes. want to speak to that. Well, maybe, well. Absolutely, because, um, I mean, Lancelot is, is noted... Uh, and, and, and Guinevere, um, they have their um, escapades, which which they embark on. Mm-hmm. However, the uh, the culmination of at least Mallory's uh, King Arthur uh, happens. I mean, one of the fascinating turning points is Lancelot's development. So it's not a um, he doesn't just turn it on a dime, but he gradually undergoes a transformation, which is. Uh, Precipitated, I guess, culminates with the refusal, her refusal to kiss him. Mm-hmm. So, and she's already professed, uh, she's already got herself to a nunnery, uh, mm-hmm. and and uh, Lancelot has the um, is professed at least the same, right? But he still wants to kiss her, mm-hmm. uh, but she rebuffs him, and this is kind of like sometimes you need a bucket of cold water splashed on your face or something like this to, to finally wake you up but um, it is a key turning point for, for mm-hmm. him it's rectifying what had gone wrong mm-hmm. uh, so if you've only read uh, uh, some of the story you might not actually right. uh, yes. uh, mm-hmm. see how the things end up um, sure yeah. It's like it's all, it's like reading only the first part of three <laughs> exactly. out of, exactly. out of well, the Divine well, Comedy well, you, right? you'll end up you're, you're going to still be in the Inferno is, 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 yes. is, is, is a problem. Yeah. Well, uh, definitely, yes. And and so, and now the next thing she says, she has the line where she's explaining why, yes, I'm in hell, but I couldn't help it because I was in love, and when you're in love, you can't control yourself. And she says, yeah. uh, this is in, by the way, further, this is Canto 5 of uh, Inferno. Yeah. She says, uh, love which quickly fastens on gentle hearts seized that wretch. Love which allows no one to escape seized me so strongly with my pleasure in him. So, you know, the images of, like, you're not in control of love. Love's in control of you. Yeah. And that line, love which quickly fastens on gentle hearts, sounds like she's paraphrasing Dante, right? Love and the gentle heart are one. Uh, yes. And when Dante hears this, when he kind of recognizes that yeah. it's his love poetry that's inspired her yes. to give her soul away, uh, he faints. Okay. It's the only time in the yes. Inferno he actually, I mean, he's, he kind of collapses a lot. Or right, like, right. You know, he's, he over- I mean, it's his hot place. Sure, it's, yeah. it's hot, it's exhausting. Yeah. There's a lot of emotion to go through, but yeah. so... Yes, in the last po- in the last canto, he talked about how he's a great poet who's up there with Homer and all that and Virgil. Yeah. But here it's, but what have you? D- with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, basically, right. what did you do? Yes. And you you've written poetry that's encouraged people to give away their eternal jewel, right? Yeah. And throw their souls away in pursuit yeah. of this ideal of love. Which where does it really lead you? Well, it leads you to hell. Now, someone like Hosier will say, yeah, but that's worth it. Love is so beautiful. Love for another person is so beautiful. But I think that's something that happens when you really forget about God or don't think there's a God there to love you, right? If the world's right. hopeless, just pick somebody to love, right? And yeah. invest yourself in them. And sure, you'll go to hell, but at least you'll have found someone who makes you feel meaningful. Yes. Right? Uh, okay, now two things to say about that. Maybe there are a few. But sure, go on. Sure, sure. Uh, so one is now it really depends on how you understand love. Right, so uh, like the Sybil in um, uh, the Aeneid, she goes into this frenzy and ecstasy where the spirits take over her, and she has these oracle powers and so on. Uh, it, it, the Virgil is presenting with us with um, this idea of being ecstatic in the sense of being consumed by another spirit mm-hmm. to the point where you lose your faculties almost, and mm-hmm. you're channeling something else, which um, important to note. Um, so 
here is that really what love is? She's calling it with the gentle. Uh, what was her line? The, the, the gentle. Oh uh, yeah, it takes uh, it takes hold of you, or uh, how should I, yeah, love which fastens itself on gentle hearts. On gentle hearts. Yes. Well, okay. So is that really what love is? Right. Uh, if it's something that ultimately absorbs you. Uh, now, if we go back to the ultimate love, God is love, uh, a triune community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not an absorption of the other, right? Uh, so there's a community, life-giving community, which by extension, God in creating us, act of love is drawing us in as well to communion, not taking over us, yes. uh, right? So not possessing us in the sense of, of, of mm-hmm. this, the gentle hearts that we do have. Uh, and it just, we can't do anything but love in that yeah. sense being driven by. So that's the first thing. Um, but mm-hmm. the, the second is, yeah, that, that this comes across even in uh, Eat Your Young, uh, this mm-hmm. uh, understanding that, because uh, what's the opening there of... Uh, you're young. Oh, was it say? I'm yes. starving, darling. Yes. Uh, yeah. that, that, so there's there's different ways we can um, read what he's meaning there. But uh, the bit about starving, mm-hmm. uh, that's the appetite. Yeah. Right. Now, how's it going to be satiated? Mm-hmm. His first point of reference, darling. Uh, so the uh, uh, yes. th- th- that love is a possesses gentle or what he thinks is love, right? Is possesses yes. gentle or Francesca thinks this is now uh, the frame of reference. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is the um, where are you going to go mm-hmm. uh, for for satisfaction? Yeah. Right? Where are you going to go? Well, now you're just left with that other object, that other person. I I, I can't help but think of Dover Beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Matthew Arnold's uh, a poem where basically he says, uh, you know, uh, the the sea of faith, uh, which uh, once was uh, at full uh, in round the shores of of the world. Has now receded, yeah. and as it pulls back, what would we find from mm-hmm. the, as the sea recedes of well, the world? Yeah. Right? What does the world have? The world's not very satisfying. <laughs> what yes. he says is uh, neither um, uh, life. Uh, oh, uh, here, uh, here it is. Uh, yep. Uh, don't worry. Uh, neither joy nor love, uh, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace. Uh, nor help for pain. So, joy, this almost sounds like the, the antithesis of the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so no, no peace, no certitude, mm-hmm. uh, no, no, no help for pain, uh, right? No, no life, no joy. Uh, and so here, what's, what are you going to do as uh, someone washed up on Dover Beach? You can enjoy the immensity of the view, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Knowing in the distance that ignorant armies clash by night, and, and you're going to see that the mm-hmm. pacifist um, element too in uh, Hosier uh, as well. Yes, uh, yeah. and, and so the infrastructure now of the, a lover, mm-hmm. can they withstand, can that hold up all of your desires, all those things? Yeah. Uh, and so that that is... Uh, Part part of the dilemma, or or the 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 reflex then of the lover is now to immediately go to uh, to to the darling. Well, uh, yes, yeah, so, okay. So I'm glad you brought up Eat Your Young because that seems so. The next song we've been requested is Eat Your Young, yeah. which seems like it's talking about something different. I'm going to argue it's not. <laughs> but um, so that song is based on the circle of the gluttons, uh, and uh, it's this is political commentary. Or this is yeah. Hosier commenting now on corruption in our economy and in our society and how uh, children especially are used as like ammunition in the culture war is what I yeah. said. Now in the United States you know, he, he talks about how they refuse to implement uh, stricter gun laws even though uh, children are being killed in school shootings and things like that. So uh, here and he, and he uses loosely kind of Dante's imagery of the uh, circle of the gluttons to describe this. So here's, uh, here's some of the lyrics for I've, 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 I've curated some of these. So it opens with uh, as you mentioned I'm starving, darling. Let me let me put my lips to something. Let me wrap my teeth around the world. Start carving, darling. I want to smell the dinner cooking. I want to feel the edges start to burn. I think that, that must be like a global warming reference to okay, the edges sure, of the earth burning. Sure, yeah. Honey, I want to race you to the table. If you hesitate, the getting is gone. I won't lie. If there's something to be gained, there's money to be made. Whatever's still to come, get some. Pull up the ladder when the flood comes. Throw enough rope until your legs have swung. Set swung. Seven new ways that you can eat your young. 
Come and get some, skinning the children for a war drum, putting food on the table, selling bombs and guns. It's quicker and easier to eat your young. You can't buy this fineness. Let me see the heat get to it. Let me watch the dressing start to peel. It's a kindness, Highness. Crumbs enough for everyone. Old and young are welcome to the meal. Now, Hosier is Irish. Hosier is Irish, right? Another thing I saw him admit that is that this is a reference to Jonathan Swift, a, a modest proposal. Uh, yes. Classic work yeah. of satire, where yes. Jonathan Swift, the Anglican clergyman, yeah. and he parodies how England has been so, you know, uh, has so maltreated the Irish. Right? Yeah. And a, a modest proposal is, <laughs> right. to solve all these economic problems yeah. and overpopulation and poverty, we should really eat Irish babies. Right. Because right? that'll, you know, that'll solve the nourishment problem, it'll reduce their population, it'll reduce the number of Catholics. It's a win-win situation. You know, the modest proposal, right, of, uh, yeah. you know, why don't we just do that? And, that, and he's satirizing how uh, frivolously England was treating Irish wives. Yeah. Now, here's what's really funny to me, though, all right? What leads to that attitude of, let's say, neoliberalism or capitalism or, yeah. or corporatism is individual selfishness, oh. right? It's putting your own will and your own desires oh. ahead of the common okay. good. And that's actually exactly what... Lancelot and Guinevere were on, thinking of doing was putting sure. their own desires before the common good of Camelot. Yeah. It's what Francesca and Paolo were doing is saying, forget everything else. Let's just love each other. Yeah. You know, depend, even if the hurricane comes, yeah. right? And uh, it, what's very interesting, I, w- I would argue that these this song is meant to be a sequel because I think, and now you've listened to the album a bunch of times too. Yeah. I think this is the only other song where he refers to the other person as darling. Because Francesca, he says, darling, I'd say, put me back in the hell, right? And this one, I'm starving, darling. So it's like they're the two same people talking to each other. Now, think about this. Is there anything where, you know, two people love each other so much that they put their own love before the common good and before the service of others, especially children? Okay. Well, what comes to mind is how a couple of years ago, or I guess four years ago now, or five years, I guess, Ireland had a referendum where it legalized abortion. Right. It amended its constitution so that abortion would be legal. Well, that sounds a lot like two couples, who, or a couple, a couple of people, two lovers, putting their own selfishness and greed and desire to just love each other and have no responsibilities attached to that ahead of the lives of children. Right. And as it happens, Hozier was out campaigning for that legalization of abortion in Ireland. Yeah. So this thing he's satirizing, that, that Swift is making fun of, yeah, the English want to just kill Irish babies. Yeah. Well, now Ireland's doing it to itself. Right. Babies, and right. Hosier is complicit in it. And right. I don't think he seems to realize... See, this is, this is like Socrates, right? How yeah. uh, song, the poets, you know, they're inspired and they, they write right. things that are smarter than they are sometimes, right? Yeah. I, I actually think this song, if you read it next to Francesca, is a critique of that. And right. Hosier doesn't recognize it. Right. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, but what, so those are, those are kind of my thoughts. I, okay, I would also say... If Hosier is concerned about economic inequality and injustice, the best way to deal with that would be to implement Catholic social teaching. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. but, uh, that's a separate topic, yeah. right? Well, well, it's not necessarily a separate topic because what are the grounds uh, by which that critique is going to be made? Right? Mm-hmm. So what, um, on what grounds are you going to critique um, appetite? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this, this is um, something that uh, uh, Lewis uh, brings up in... Um, uh, abolition of man, mm-hmm. but basically, if you're operating outside the Tao, so the Tao would be natural law, n- natural law, uh, the divine, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're operating outside of that, upon what grounds then can, can you use reason to critique some uh, behaviors over others, right? Yeah, because essentially you're just driven by impulse, by appetite. So mm-hmm. for Lewis uh, here, um, it just like well. The, the, the poet who's washed up on the shores of Dover Beach, mm-hmm. all you're left with are the impulses of life, mm-hmm. uh, right? And, and you take them as they come. Uh, so whether it's by um, hereditary digestion or <laughs> right, cir- right, circumstance, yeah. sure. as, as, as Lewis puts it, uh, th- this, is, this is what informs how you behave, mm-hmm. right? And, and it, so again, to go back to if you're not operating out of a moral law or a mm-hmm. framework, or you're just not sure if that exists or not, uh, you don't have grounds by which you can actually make those. Uh, now, here, mm-hmm. you, you become a creature of the whole. And by what I mean by that is you become a, a creature, you become part of nature again. And if you look at the, um, this is what he means by abolition, Lewis means by abolition of man. Uh, one becomes, oh, what's that? 
Oh, right, right. Here's, this, is, this is Lewis. He says, the real objection is that if man chooses to treat himself as raw material, so mm-hmm. here just insert um, one driven by appetite or impulse, mm-hmm. uh, love, uh, as mm-hmm. Francesca would define it. Raw material, he will be. <laughs> Not raw material to be na- manipulated, as he fondly imagined by himself, mm-hmm. uh, but by mere appetite, that is, mere nature. And, and so the, the metaphor, the analogy that... Um, Lewis offers is nature. Uh, we think we've just dominated her. Uh, we've we've come to this moment of, of our triumph, and it looks like our arms are out in surrender. But really, when we go to grasp, she embraces it and brings us in. Yeah. So so here again, uh, Lewis is addressing something slightly different with technocracy. Uh, Hoosier is here addressing. Um, Appetite, a different type of not, mm-hmm. not not libido dominati, but concupiscence, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's where he's going, but it is leading to the same uh, root, uh, the same end. So if we think of the uh, cover of this album, uh, yes. so on this cover of the album, what is there? It's 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 profound and it's, yeah. it's very telling. Uh, going back to Socrates, there, um, mm-hmm. if you look at it closely, it's like whoa, what's going on? It looks like he's in a garden singing, except the, uh, there you can see like the earth there beside him and. Uh, this mouth, got, it, all, all that's visible of him is his mouth, kind of emerging out of the dirt, yeah, but biting a, uh, a, a, a flower. flower yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's almost indistinguishable, man from nature. It's this is the envelopment of man, yeah. and what's left? Well, you get yeah, you have some voice that's that's coming out, yeah. uh, and, and and be able to sing and so on, uh, giving a voice to what? Well, whatever impulse that that comes to, him. let yeah. us stay in this this moment, uh, and uh, or whatever, whatever it might be. So um, if you look closely, even uh, on that cover, there, there, it looks like there's dirt within his teeth. I mean, oh, the, yeah. the guy definitely brushes his teeth because his teeth are shining white. But, <laughs> the, uh, but there are dirt, but, yeah, but there's dirt, dirt within his teeth. Within yeah. the teeth. So it's, it's this, um, the synthesis, the, the absorption of, of a man and nature is, is almost, this, this, it's, it's a poster child for what Lewis is talking about yeah. in the abolition of man uh, being absorbed. Now, what are you left with mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're operating outside the Tao? Okay, what are you left with? Well, all you're left with is nature. Mm-hmm. Okay, which um, he, here your your uh, where where are you going to go to for how you view what you should do in life or what you should do? So again, going back to trying to find that impulse, that light. Okay, well here how about this? Let's let's talk about the opening and closing songs of of, of this album. Sure. I think that this might help to uh, so De Shelby Part One opens it and then. Uh, First light is what, is what closes mm-hmm. it, and uh, as you sent me the the music, I just put it on play. And when I go to work, I usually like to listen to one song all day long. I'll just you know days on end, depending because on loop, it, on yeah. loop because it, it I just it blocks everything out. I don't hear the lyrics because you hear you can become sure, tone yeah, deaf yeah. to it and you just work and productive. Sure, yeah. So I put it on and forgot repeat was on. So when it was over, it just went back to the first song and I didn't notice at first. It yeah. seemed like it was just continuing because. The last and the first are, are, are there's this continuity between them. So mm-hmm. here, if you go to the um, lyrics of First Light, it, it's beautifully um, optimistic in, in some ways. It's talking about before the sun comes up, uh, one bright morning changes all, right? Well, it's, it's a reference to how at the end of the Inferno, Dante emerges out of hell. He climbs up Satan's leg and gets out of hell, and he's back on dry land. He sees the sun for the first time. So it's a hopeful ending. It's not the end of the story, but it's a hopeful ending to the Inferno, and that's what he's invoking in the last song of the album, First Light. Right. Yeah. So, so as you emerge from the Earth, mm-hmm. right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what happens? Well, this, this sky set to burst, gold and rust, the color erupts, filling my cup, the sun coming up. Mm-hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? And you think of yeah. just um, our life as uh, on a microcosm in a 24-hour period. Of, of our entire life well each morning then is mm-hmm. like a new beginning yeah. so this anticipation before the day unfolds and can go sideways on us uh, we, sure. we, we, right, we, right. we we crave this mm-hmm. this this first um, this this first light um, like I live my whole life before the first light so it's almost as if I'm wanting to uh, capture this somehow mm-hmm. because that's all you're left with if you are just part of nature. Mm-hmm. Some some things might come your way, some impulses, some some experiences, some relationships, but it's all beyond you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, you're, you're, there's no grounds to critique um, or manipulate what's what's um, 
beyond other than uh, more more appetite. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to the opening song, then uh, what are we left with? At last, when all the world is asleep, you take in the air, uh, take in the blackness of air, the likes of a darkness so deep that God at the start couldn't bear. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're left back with this um, this this space in which. Uh, um, the, the, the uh, darkness pervades, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Uh, and you, you're back in the loop, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So there's there's no you you they put it another way. There's no purgatorial, right? It's yeah. just this book. This is this is all we're left with is the info. Yes, and and we're back into the same thing. And the, the album itself is cyclical almost. Like if you listen to it on loop, it it seamlessly. I mean, this is intentional. It's brilliant, but it seems to be. I, it, like like the Inferno, it's in a circle, and and also a bit like um, the, the opening two songs are called the the Selby, uh, which yeah. is a reference to a, uh, yeah. an Irish. Uh, yeah. I mean, he compares it to like a Alice in Wonderland kind right. of. Yeah. Um, now here's it's the quote from the author here. Okay. It says, uh, the author of that book, The Third Policeman, which and the protagonist is a student of a philosopher named De Selby. That's the context. Okay. Um, the author said, when you get to the end of this book. You realize that my hero or main character has been dead throughout the book, and all the queer, cast, ghastly things which have been happening to him are happening in a sort of hell he's earned for the killing. It is made clear that this sort of thing goes on forever. And then there's a passage that has been omitted from the novel that he wrote, where he said, um, uh, talks about hell is the beginning of the unfinished, the rediscovery of the familiar, the re-experience of the already suffered, the fresh forgetting of the unremembered. Yeah. Hell goes round and round. It in shape, it is circular. And by nature, it is interminable, repetitive, and very nearly unbearable. It's cyclical, right? Oh, abs know? Absolutely. And so what are your options? Mm -hmm. to break what are, out what are your options? Well, 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 well okay. You, yeah, yeah, or that's what we, you might say, or I might say, right? But let, let's say you're, that's not your worldview, right? Let's, sure. let's say there is no hope beyond that. So what are you left with? The, the, basically, at that point, there's nothing to do but find someone to love. Exactly. And create your own meaning. And in that sense, what you have to do then is kind of, what, what we're looking for is unity, right? And unity with anything created means dissolving yourself. Um, yes. Like, so, so, okay, can, can, I, can I just sure, go, go with that? Okay, so the song before Francesca is um, first time. So the idea of... Um, you have to, uh, would you say dissolve? Uh, well, I, I, let me okay. quote, I mean, I'll, I'll let you go on the okay. other thing. The Selby part one ends with a, a okay. section in Gaelic, okay. right? Okay. Uh, with I, the Irish language, uh, which I've the, said the before song. is a theme. The song, yeah. The song, yeah. 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 Um, it's really lovely, that mm -hmm. section. Uh, the English translation for it is, uh, for that section is, cause, and remember, he's talked about darkness. The song has this theme of darkness. Yeah. And in dark, in light, there's there's clarity, there's definition. Like, mm. you can see where things right. begin. And yeah. In darkness, everything kind of melts into one, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Gaelic that he's singing translates as, you're all bright ease, but you come on like night, entangled, together transformed. You're all bright ease, but you come on like night. Art is a transformation. It's a dark art. And his commentary yeah. on it in the video, I watched his video. This is my student recommended. Watch his commentary video. So I did. He says, uh, there's the quote so, where he so says, he comments on his own There's video. videos he did by where he's like, I think they're called Behind the Song. Oh, interesting. Uh, he says, uh, you and I are sort of mixed up together. You and I metamorphosized. So the same idea of you can't see where one begins and one ends. It's a kind of actual metamorphosis of some kind. So does he mean the lover and love? I think that's what he's yeah. talking about. Okay. Like so it's, it's like you're entering into true. a darkness where sure. there's an intermingling. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. Which, um, okay, the, it, going back to, like, let's say, like uh, the Leviathan, like this is nature, right? The, the art, uh, which uh, now the artificial man will, will shape and so on. But that's, yeah. that's part of the modern project, right? Yeah. Is manipulating nature by art so this is the dark art uh by which we we um sure, ma manipulate yes. and and get, get lose ourselves with. in the process uh, yes yeah now um going back to impulse and so what are we left with right so let, let's just bracket out the divine there's no escape uh we're going back in the cycle again well i mean it's like kind of like the work day i mean what 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 do you what what's the best part of the work day well Coffee break, probably, uh, right? Maybe lunch hour. Sure, okay. I mean, there's there's a few perks. Oh, uh, teaching, of course. Oh, sorry, how could I forget that? Sure uh, <laughs> Love that. I, sending emails, corrections. That's probably not uh, on the mm. list. All the administrative stuff and so on. So there are going to be some ups and downs to the day. Mm -hmm. 
and I guess that's all we can hope for is more ups than downs as as we go through the 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 revolution of mm-hmm. of the cycle. Okay, now going back to the song right because Francesca, at least in the ly- lyrics that I found, has an ellipsis. Uh, it opens with an ellipsis. Mm. So, hmm, why would it start with a dot, dot, dot? Uh, well, perhaps it's connecting to the song right before it. Mm. Now, I don't know if that was uh, sure, the original sure. lyrics or that was someone it's else. It's a very cohesive album, so plausibly, yeah. All right, mm. so here's the last lines that come right before it. This is from uh, First Time. Um, some part of me, and this is kind of the refrain, some part of me must have died the final time you called me baby. Some part of me came alive the final time you called me baby. Okay, well, this is a bit of a paradox, is it not? Sure. Uh, some part of me died, some part of me came alive. Uh, the, the final time you call me baby. Mm-hmm. So this this embrace of a lover, mm-hmm. whether it's the first time or the final time, the final time, something lives, something dies, and then you move on. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so, so something's happening, but there's, there's no ultimate end to it. Mm-hmm. Um, here it reminds me a little bit of the Kierkegaard. So, yeah, so, so I was thinking about it as well. And his yeah. way out. So, so for some of our listeners, might be familiar with Descartes and his problem with the cogito. Uh, he gets out of the box of how do I know existence? Well, I think therefore I am. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, Kierkegaard finds he's boxed into a similar corner. Um, we can't understand existence in the sense we can't grasp all of it and, and, and understand it. So what's the way out? Mm-hmm. Passion. Passion is the key that gets us out of the, the corner by exerting our will mm-hmm. and taking then that leap of faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Nietzsche will run with that in a different direction by exerting your will. He's, he's in the same trajectory of Kierkegaard. Mm-hmm. But that's the way out mm-hmm. of this corner we're boxed in. Passion. Mm-hmm. Passion is the key. So here in these lyrics, mm-hmm. uh, I guess there's the appetites, but there's also the thumos, right? Sure, the, sure. The, the, uh, it has to be the heart, uh, which which is involved. So the some part of me must have died the first, uh, uh, the final time you call me baby, and some part of me came alive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so because that that this is this. Um, well, sure, but Hosier, but Hosier is essentially putting the language of death and resurrection towards a lover. Now, Kierkegaard has the credit that he understands that you have to do this towards the infinite. It has to be towards uh, God. Right. To the point where he negates his own real-life love with Regine, right, in the interest of... Whole thing in itself, we're, we're, I'm looking at the clock. We, get, we got another song to get through. But, okay, sure. I will, but I will point out, though, yeah. um, that thing of uh, if there's no meaning, you have to get passionate about something, right? Yeah. Again, I don't know if this is on purpose by Hozier, because if it is, it's a great self-critique. The opening lines, again, of uh, Eat Your Young, Yep. I'm starving, darling. Yep. Let me put my lips to something. Let me yep. wrap my teeth around the world. Yep. Now, in a, and again, his, in his video on the song, he says actually, he's intentionally opened it in a way where it sounds like it might be sexual. Mm. Right? Uh, I'm so starving, let me put my lips to something. And you're thinking, oh, it'll be a kiss. Oh, no, it's about dis- devouring the world. Yep. Well, how interesting. Again, if you can put it next to Francesca, like, they're both passionate desires. Yes. It's a meaningless world. Find yep. your meaning in something. <laughs> yeah. It could, you could choose someone to love, or you could dominate the world and get rich and leave everybody else behind. Both of those involve a kind of forgetfulness of the world, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, in the case of you, you love somebody so much that the whole world doesn't exist. It's just you and this person. Yeah. Even if you have to kill your own young, right? Sure. Or, yeah. you know, you love, you know, your desire so much that you don't care if you're going to burn the world with, you know, global warming or economic yeah. inequalities or whatever. And, it, and again, why should you? Why should you care if there's no deeper meaning to any of this, right? Right. Well, it's just, uh, again, like, like the Hobbes, it's like the art by which we make. Like nature, mm-hmm. we just shape it how we want. So this mm-hmm. is the dark art, whichever direction we're going to take the dark art. Sure. Um, well, and darkness, and the, I think, and again, that's, I think, Hozier, his lyrics show where that goes. Because here's the problem mm-hmm. with committing yourself to somebody who's not infinite, is they can turn on you and betray you. Ah. So, you know, is, is there's, a song, so? there's a song called First Time. You okay. know, I yes. came alive the first time you called yep. me, baby. Yep. But there's another song on there called All Things End, mm. which is about how relationships sometimes end. And not just end, but they you can be betrayed. So a song which was not requested, but leads into one that was. Okay. Uh, there's a song on here called Unknown, also known as Nth. Oh, yeah. um, and that's about a breakup where the person you were dating betrays you. Mm-hmm. And the imagery there is taken from the lowest circle of hell, which you were alluding to earlier, the circle of the traitors. And in the circle of the traitors, Lucifer is trapped in a, uh, a lake of ice, 
Well, he's trapped in a lake, and he's beating his wings so fiercely that it actually makes a cold wind that freezes the ice around yes. him. Yes. And Lucifer's trapped there forever because he's the great traitor of God, and he's eternally chewing on Judas and Brutus, the great traitors of Jesus and Caesar. And in this song, um, Hozier compares his lover who's betrayed him to Lucifer. And yeah. There's, and there's a lyric, again, it's, there's so much, but like I'll just this lyric in particular... You called me angel for the first time. My heart leapt from me. In the, you called me angel for the first time. Right. It's an allusion back to that song, right? First time you called me baby. Right. You called me yeah. angel for the first time. My heart leapt from me. You smile now. I can see its pieces still stuck in your teeth. Yeah. Just like Lucifer chewing on Judas and Brutus. Again, you can find video or Hozier comp- confirms that that's an allusion. To right, that right. So, well, yeah, but he says, well, uh, also there, where you held... Uh, where you were held frozen like an angel to me. Exactly, right? you were frozen so, like an angel to me, yeah. yeah. So he's pretty explicit about this. So if you're going to, like, why would you give yourself over totally to somebody in complete love and you're willing to go to hell for that person when they could betray you? Right. What's, what good does that get you? And what's funny is in this other, the final song requested by our student, which is not on this album, it's an earlier song, From Eden, uh, he portrays himself as the devil, actually. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll, read, I'll just read the, the lyrics of that really quickly. Babe, there's something tragic about you, something so magic about you. Don't you agree? Babe, there's something lonesome about you, something so wholesome about you. Get closer to me. Honey, you're familiar, like my mirror years ago. Idealism sits in prison. Chivalry fell on its sword. Mm. Innocence died screaming. Honey, ask me, I should know. I slithered here from Eden just to sit outside your door. Babe, there's something wretched about this, something so precious about this. Where to begin? Babe, there's something broken about this, but I might be hoping about this. Oh, what a sin. Uh, To the strand, a picnic planned for you and me, a rope in hand for your other man to hang from a tree. Now, Mm -hmm. that lyric right there, that's very Edenic as well, right? Um, Let's have a picnic, just like the the snake invites Eve to a picnic. And, you know, your your, your man can hang from the tree. You know, it's such... That's, of course, what happens to Adam. Betray betray him, hanging from the tree. Absalom as well. Absalom, it goes back right as a motif, for sure. So... Um, I think these are pretty self-evident lyrics, but it's interesting. He so he says there's something wholesome about you. There's also something lonesome about you. He says this is there's something broken about this. But hey, let's go for it anyways. Yeah, boy, that, to me that sounds like libido dominati. Mm-hmm. That sounds like I you yeah you you're a wholesome person and I want. It's funny, this whole thing that our student appreciates about uh, some of his other lyrics, that it's more worshipful mm-hmm. and respectful of a woman, doesn't want to control them. Not here. To me, this right. is like the... Uh, now, maybe he's playing a character, sure. but it's still... like Maybe he doesn't see himself as the devil. Maybe he's the person being seduced by the devil, sure. um, like he is in the Unknown song. But the point is, he's, he knows people can do this to you. Right. So maybe maybe you shouldn't maybe you shouldn't throw yourself into uh, love with people and disregard everything else and disregard the state of your own soul. No um, way. Because in a sense, and this goes back to your earlier question, is that even love? Right. Because you know maybe Hozier is right. Maybe love is the answer to our of our problems. Well, it but, has to be. But maybe this isn't actually love. <laughs> Right. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I was going to ask you a question here, but you wanted to save it for the end, which we're almost at. So let me okay, let me sure. say my concluding thought. Okay. Um, so I think Hozier gives great voice to um, the perspective you have, in a sense, if if you're not going to, if you bracket out the Paradiso and the Purgatorio, the mm-hmm. hope that there's something beyond this world, um, which of course hell is. Hell in Dante is this. I mean, what happens in Dante is Lucifer falls to the earth. And the earth moves out of the way to make room for him. <laughs> and the space that's left is hell. And the earth that moved up is now the mountain of purgatory. Right. right? That you have to climb up to get to heaven, right? Yeah. Which you then float up to the Paradiso. Yeah. So in, a, in one sense, hell is the only place that's in earth, you know, in right. Dante. Yeah. So if all you have is earth, yeah. then I guess that's the best you can hope for is, is Francesca and Paolo, which might seem superficially appealing, but Dante is very clever. If you think about it, it really is hell. There's ultimately a nihilism to that because, yeah. you know, Francesca and Paul, it might seem so romantic to, like, give your soul for this person you love, but eventually you're going to hit a wall with that. <laughs> eventually that's going to bottom out, right, with any creature, right? Now, compare this back to Dante. I'll, I'll conclude with Dante here because he, like I said, loves Beatrice and he has kind of a courtly love for her. And in a sense, the Divine Comedy is about her, right? He's, he begins with him lost in a dark wood and it's Beatrice who prays for Virgil to come and guide 
Dante to, yes. to be with her in heaven, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and that's the story, right? It's, and then they finally encounter each other. Dante finally sees Beatrice in heaven. He's been longing for her. He almost worships her, right? It comes very close to worship for her. Um, but ultimately, she directs him to God. And the end of the poem isn't the two of them being united. It's actually him moving on from her, even though he's been longing for her the entire time. Uh, this is in Paradiso 31. Uh, and there's 33 cantos, uh, because 33 is a very important number, right? Uh, he says this final thing to her, O lady in whom my hope is strong, who for my salvation did endure in hell to leave the imprint of my feet, of whatsoever things I have beheld, as coming from thy power and from thy goodness, I recognize the virtue and grace. Thou from a slave hast brought me unto freedom by all those ways and by all the expedients whereby thou hast the power of doing it. So it's very worshipful almost. You, mm -hmm. by your power, you know, by your grace, you, Beatrice, you've guided me out of hell, all right? Preserve towards me thy magnificence, so that this soul of mine which thou hast healed, pleasing to thee, be loosened from the body. Now, thus I implored, and she so far away smiled as it seemed, and looked once more unto me, and then unto the eternal fountain she turned. Mm -hmm. okay. So they look at each other one last time. They show mm -hmm. one, and he, yes. and he thanks her. You, our, your love for me has freed me. It saved me. You know, kind of like Hozier talks about love for this woman as being, or whoever it is, yeah. as being kind of salvific to him. But then she gives him one last smile, and she turns and looks away. Mm -hmm. And then there's two more cantos where Dante then himself goes and looks at God. And mm -hmm. that's the happy ending. That's the true love. And actually, Dante and Beatrice are closer to each other than Francesca and Paolo ever will be. Because they're united together in the eternal love of God. Even though they're not looking straight at each other, they're looking at God next to each other. But that's actually a deeper unity than if they were to just look at each other. Right. Oh. Um, and it's incredible. I mean, and like uh, the commentary I have in my edition talks about uh, Dante talks about Beatrice in a way that almost goes beyond orthodoxy. You know, it's mm. almost idolatry. But he recognizes that she is an allegory and a, and a means of grace. Right? right. She's the one who leads Dante to God by virtue of her goodness and beauty. But those are reflections of the attributes of God. So she's a channel, not right. a source of grace. Yes. And, and that's seen the fact that then Dante eventually goes on beyond her. He couldn't have got there without her. Yeah. But, and that, I think, is the most powerful romantic story probably maybe ever written, or at least it's up there. And uh, I, I, want, I want to end by talking about another great Irish poet, mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, yes. right? and, who uh, had a powerful, um, heartbreaking romance as well with Joy Gresham, uh, who he married, and uh, a very interesting story there. But, of course, she dies. Uh, of cancer, I want to say, which he, which Hozier uses some cancer imagery right. earlier in, yeah. the, in the album yeah. too. Uh, I'm going to read the so then C.S. Lewis struggles with this, and he writes a, a grief observed about how he struggled with his faith after Joy Gresham had died. Um, and so I'm going to read this the final couple paragraphs here. He says once he's talking about when she was on her deathbed. Lewis says once very near the end, I said, if you can, if it is allowed, come to me when I too am on my deathbed. Aloud, she said, heaven would have a job to hold me, and as for hell, I'd break it into bits. She knew she was speaking a kind of mythological language, but with even an element of comedy in it. <laughs> but there was a twinkle as well as a tear in her eye. But there was no myth and no joke about the will, deeper than any feeling that flashed through her. But I mustn't, because I have come to misunderstand a little less completely what a pure intelligence must be. There is also, whatever it means the resurrection of the body. We cannot understand. The best is perhaps what we understand least. Didn't people dispute once whether the final vision of God was more an act of intelligence or of love? That is probably another of the nonsense questions. How wicked it would be if we could to call the dead back, which is what he had been earlier saying. He wished he could call her back because he missed her so much, but now he realizes how wicked that would be to call her back from God. And then these are the last two sentences. Oh, it's just, she said, not to me, but to the chaplain, I am at peace with God. She smiled, but not at me. And then he quotes Dante. And then unto the eternal fountain she turned. Oh, man. It's just, I, oh, that just, even reading that out loud is so powerful, right? So this is another question for Hozier. You give yourself in love to somebody, well, what happens when they die, mm -hmm. right? What happens if, yeah. if they go the way of Beatrice or Joy Gresham, right? Well, ultimately, like, if you want something that's, um, you know, adoration and worship, that's not possessive, right? How is this, you know? Through them, they become an image of the God whose love really is eternal and infinite, right? Yeah. And, and the really loving act, the thing that's really liberating, if you really love somebody, you won't want them to worship you. 
you'll want them to look through you onwards to God, who has the real love, the love that created, the love that moves the sun and all the other stars, as the Divine Comedy says in its final line. Um, which is why I, uh, I wish Hozier would read the rest of the Divine yeah, Comedy, right. and I pray that one day he, like Dante, has an experience where he kind of looks at what he's written and, and, has, and is gripped with uh, regret over it, maybe faints like Dante did in, <laughs> when he sees Francesca, and uh, maybe write, you know, writes a Divine Comedy to make up for what he wrote in the past. Sure, sure. Um, be, those are my, uh, my final thoughts, I guess, about that. Uh, yeah. What did you want to speak to? Uh, well, I guess I mean, it struck me on first listening to it, is it's not a... Um... Uh, like in a post-Christian world, if you want to think of it that way, for a work that is, uh, our world is purported like uh, along those lines, it's constantly coming back to the divine, even if yeah. it's at a distance, right? Mm-hmm. Even if there's mm-hmm. it's, it's cut off, and, and so th- there's this almost, um, I guess maybe not post-Christian, but there's this constant reference and defiance mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, of it. Certainly, um, I mean, couched in, with, with agnosticism, and so on. So I think it's easy to write off. Mm-hmm. But there's a brilliance to it. Oh yeah. Uh, there, there's a there's a deep uh, profundity to the um, the way it's stitched together and woven yeah. uh, mm-hmm. musically, lyrically. Uh, here, uh, and think of um, how it was produced, right? Or when the context, uh, COVID, right? Uh, mm-hmm. w- what happened then? Well, you had these lockdowns. Uh, during lockdown, what becomes most important? <laughs> oh gosh. Depends who you're asking, I guess. Sure. Well, but, but, but for you, like when you, when you couldn't do, go anywhere or do anything, like what what, what became oh, most con- important? I guess connection, right? You just yeah. wanted to not be alone. Absolutely. You know? mm-hmm. So I, I think this is a profound expression of. I mean, that's one of the fruits, I think, of, mm-hmm. of having to go through lockdowns and so on. Is you start to realize what is actually most important. I mean. Mm-hmm. God forbid that you can't go to work the next day, or, <laughs> right, right, you know, yeah, or sure. the NBA stops playing games or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. You, like, who thought this could ever happen? Uh-huh. But yeah. then you start to realize, well, actually, yeah, we can still function without all of this. <laughs> uh, but can we function without our family? Mm-hmm. Can we function without our friends? Can we function without love in our mm-hmm. life and people to love? And so I think this is a very profound work of art uh-huh. in that giving expression to the movement of, 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 of the heart. And so, um, like, the first time you call me baby, mm-hmm. it's almost as if that's a reset. Uh, mm-hmm. This is like the year AD now, or zero. <laughs> right, right. right Th- yeah. this, this is how we're going to uh, commence our, our, our capturing of time. The caveat here, the caution, is that can be infuriating as well. Mm-hmm. Just as the... Um, you know, you thought the lockdowns were over, and like, oh wait, there's another mandate, mm-hmm. uh, and it's like, what again? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so, oh, it's lifted. Oh, but the restrictions are coming back, and it's almost like this incessant. How do you get out of that? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. How do you get out of that? But it's the again going back to the cyclical nature of of, of the lyrics and the way the songs are tied together. What is the way out? Mm-hmm. Right. So, what is the way out of this? Uh, and here, thinking, uh, you're talking about uh, Francesca. As well as um, uh, a joy, a Gresham, like at the end, she's Dante and uh, Lewis are pointed mm-hmm. elsewhere, mm-hmm. right? Now you, you talked about, uh, and, and some commentators saying like Dante's pushing this Francesca mm-hmm. to the point of idolatry. Almost. Here it reminds me of the opposite of Feuerbach. Feuerbach is um, a prominent atheist mm-hmm. who, who's the fiery uh, brook in which Marx says all need to be baptized yes, uh, yeah, as he adopts yeah. his atheism. Mm-hmm. And what, what does Feuerbach say about God? Well, he says, self-knowledge is knowledge of God. Yeah. Uh, self-consciousness is, con- is, is God-conscious. So basically, all our good attributes have been exalted, idealized in yeah. the divine. That, mm-hmm. That's where they're... But you know what? we got to take them back. Yeah. we got to take what's ours. Mm-hmm. Religion is like a vampire. It sucks that out of us. Mm-hmm. And instead, we need to take back what's right for lives, wrest these from the divine, mm-hmm. and keep them. Because mm-hmm. that's who we truly are, are meant to be. And so for Feuerbach, then, um, th- this is the the impulse. It's uh, Now, uh, part of the problem, though, is it, he's going to lead to this fiery decapitation of man, <laughs> as mm-hmm. some colonists have put it. In other words, what happens if that's all we have? Right. Well, now it's like um, uh, in, uh, 
Brave New World. It's like the sign of the Ford, right? You, you've lost your head. Uh, you've lost the noetic, uh, right? You've lost reason. Um, and by extension, you're the true vision of, of what reality is. All you're left with then are your relationships. Mm-hmm. Now, those are key. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but that that's all that um, we can... Uh, 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 that's our frame of reference. That's the year zero now. Mm. But again, if there's no way out of it, then what? So, mm. it, it, so the irony is that it becomes infuriating. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? it, just as COVID was infuriating uh, and the inferno mm. is infuriating, yeah. um, this without a release, without a vision, without, um, well, as Augustine says, in your light we see light. So mm. without that light of God, what are we left with? Right? Mm. So we're left with uh, nature, we're left with the relationships. We're left with being absorbed back into um, uh, nature. Which the title, I think, I, I think it refers to. Because <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 this is unearth. my interpretation of yeah. it. Is that, yeah. you know, unreal you think of as an adjective, but then it's yeah. unreal, unearth. Well, unearth is a verb. So then presumably unreal would be a verb too. So what would it mean to unreal something? I guess it'd be to de-real it, but to make it, un- to make it unreal. Like to reverse it from reality into unreality. As if, let's say, we're regressing into chaos or being absorbed into the darkness. Absolutely. Which is what happens in a love where you just dissolve and become one with either the cosmos or like with the person you love. In contrast to the love of God, which is, first of all, in the Trinity, where it's you're you're united to god in a way where you're still distinct from god you actually keep your individuality while yet being yep. completely yes. consumed yes. into the divine yep. nature yep. you know because the end game for a cyclical world view uh, and i'm not sure even if it's uh, that hopeful here in the, in this album but uh, mm-hmm. we're still stuck in the earth but at least the end game in um, in eastern religions is absorption right mm-hmm. it's a dissolution of your identity and you become absorbed dissolved into the absolute uh, but um, it so yes, that, 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 that's the questions that it peaks, that it, that it raises within us, and uh, I suppose uh, the hopefulness, at least, is it's not um, entirely nihilistic, right? So, so, right. so, so there is believing in love is already a start. Exactly, it's yeah. already a start. Yeah. I mean, if, I'll concede maybe that point to Dante in that uh, <laughs> ah, put, yes. putting the love yes. in the earlier uh, right, yes, uh, candles, class or spiritual lens uh, uh, again, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, fair but, enough. Uh, and I think in the future, well, a, a soon coming episode will be about Johnny Cash, who is apocalyptic. Ah, uh, yes. Where there is an end, there's a definite end in oh, history yes. and a meaning. And uh, uh, Johnny Cash may seem like an odd uh, comparison to oh, no. Hosier, oh, but no. the more I think about it, the more fitting it is. Yes. But, well, but anyways, we're well over an hour sure. now, so we'll and, get into that so, when we get to that. But, and yes, uh, and speaking of the end, yeah, let's, let's and I think it's, it's a nice um, cleansing of the palate is is to listen to the when the man comes around, uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it does get us out. I think. Um, of that cycle, right? Because because that's the breaking up. But we'll say that. Perhaps we'll say that. But I will. Let me just think by yeah. thanking our student for recommending yes. those three songs. So really, this has been delightful to get into this music and to talk about this. Um, and we'll do a couple more episodes on uh, music analysis uh, again. But uh, so again, students who are listening, please submit at your request to us. It's, we're not just doing this for your sake. It really um, it's really beneficial to us too. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, with that being said, do you want to close in prayer, Doctor Clark? Let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten Son into this world to draw us out of darkness to bring us into your marvelous light we thank you for the cross and resurrection which is one for us through this redemption uh, and through the blood of the lamb we thank you lord for this great sharing of your love we thank you for raising up this world uh, through uh, the cross we thank you for the relationships which we have we thank you for all the loved ones who are in our lives for the examples the wisdom of the saints we pray that Uh, They may be touchstones which point us towards you, your loving embrace, and your heart. We thank you, Father, once again for all your graces. We ask that you continue to allow us to grow in love of you and love of neighbor, for you are love itself. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.